Welcome everybody to another episode of Indie Reads Aloud. Today we have an encore author joining us. Michael Samardyke will be here and he is going to be reading from his collection of short stories titled Invasion of the President Snatchers. Welcome Michael, thanks for coming back. Hi Diana, it's great to be back. I, I love it when you come back to read for us because unlike authors that read from their novels, I get the beginning, the middle, and the end from you. <laughs> so I really enjoy that. Oh, that's um, mm -hmm. So this genre is science fiction, a little bit different from the last one you read. Right, right. This is science fiction, and the stories in Invasion of the President Snatchers, um, my background is in history. Okay, so they tend to be sort of alternate history, or they look at the history of science fiction with sort of an ironic slant on it and stuff like that. So um, it, it's not, you know, deep space Star Trek Got type it. of science fiction. It's more okay. sticks closer to Earth. Super. Okay. A little bit about Michael. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio. He is a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop and has won the Lonesome, Pri Lonesome Pine Short Story Contest twice for Snowman and The Rest of the Way Home and the Appalachian Heritage Writers Symposium contest for the Frankenstein doll, which he read another time on our program. He currently lives and writes in southwestern Virginia. Today he's going to be reading from his short story collection, Invasion of the President Snatchers, and the story he's going to be reading is Keep Watching the Skies. Attempts to reshape the past, recapture the past, prevent a nightmarish future, and find hidden meanings abound in the seven science fiction stories in Invasion of the President Snatchers. Besides the title story, this book includes The First World War Shall Not Take Place, Zoo Days, Where's the Rest of Me, Keep Watching the Skies, and The Man Who Could Read Between the Lines. I am really interested to hear a new genre coming from you. Um, I love authors who write in multiple genres because we get to see different facets of that process. So when you are ready, Michael, please take the microphone and read aloud. Okay, great. The story is Keep Watching the Skies. The top brass had a job for me. Find Rotwang, they said. He's bigger than von Braun, Oberth, and Heisenberg all put together. The Soviets get him, we may as well surrender. If the Soviets get you, we never heard of you. So I went into the Soviet zone of the great German metropolis, looking for a guy with mechanical hands. I ran from rubble pile to rubble pile, one step ahead of the Ivans I knew had to be on my tail. As I paused near a wrecked cathedral, the clash of metal against metal made me look up. There on the roof, a man with black mechanical hands struggled with a woman. In the moonlight, I could see his hands rip the skin from her face, revealing the shining metal beneath. Suddenly, the roof gave way and they both fell. When I got to them, Rotwang was dead. The robot woman lay broken into pieces. What was I going to do now? You were interested in Herr Professor Dr. Rotwang, Nick Farr? I turned to see a curly-headed crowd smoking a cigarette. His hands were made out of black metal. I wanted to take him to the USA, I said. His eyes gleamed. Ah, America, land of the future. His cigarette hand made a dismissive sweeping gesture over the rubble around him. Germany is the land of the dead Gothic past. Who are you? I asked. Peter Merkwürdigsleben, he said, and clicked his heels and bowed. I was Herr Professor Dr. Wrotwang's closest assistant. You have mechanical hands, like he did. Ah, he made them for me after an accident. After all, not even a genius such as Rotwang could actually replicate a human being to preserve his intelligence into the future. That is the stuff of, what do you Americans call it, science fiction? This was taking too long. Let's get out before the Ivans find us, I said. So I got Merck vertically but back to our side of the line. Still, I had failed to get Rotwang, and the top brass rewarded me by sending me to the North Pole as a military attache to some dismal scientific project. I think the purpose of the station was to test levels in boredom. The only excitement I got was from playing poker with the Air Force guys. 
particularly particularly one second Louis called of all things Jack Ripper. It was boredom, nothing but boredom until the day the flying saucer went down. The public thinks it's no, it knows the story of our heroic struggle against the first invasion of earth. That's a laugh and a half. It was a grade A snafu all down the line. We blew up the saucer trying to get it out of the ice. The one alien that survived the blast got loose when some numbnut drafty covered the block of ice that was frozen in with an electric blanket because he couldn't stand looking at the thing. Worse, the top scientist on the project actually tried to help that thing from another world try to eat us. What saved us, America, and the whole planet Earth was that the wiring for the base was purely second rate. The thing fried itself on a loose wire. My buddy Ripper had gotten himself beat up bad in the final fight with the thing. I felt real sorry for him. He had seen the thing drinking the blood of his buddies, buddies that our arrogant scientist had set up as a snack for the monster. Essence, wit, he said to me. It came from outer space to drink our essence. It wants our pure essence. Right, Jack, I told him. Just sleep it off. He grabbed my arm. The scientist betrayed us, wit. You can't trust civilians. No, you can't, I said. Sleep it off. Well, the press overlooked the snafus and made us out to be heroes, even that two-faced bastard of a scientist. Frankly, the public needed good news on the outer space front. While we had been scrambling for our lives at the North Pole, another flying saucer had landed in Washington, D.C. itself. This alien seemed to be friendly, although he had a really ugly robot with him. And yet another snafu, the soldiers sent to guard the saucer, shot up this friendly alien, who then refused to meet Truman and flew back to whatever planet he came from. The whole business made us North Pole boys look like heroes by comparison, and promotions flowed our way. I wrangled a job as a special advisor to the Secretary of Defense for alien and paranormal encounters. Initially, having a desk job bored me. A Tyrannosaurus that had been revived by an A-bomb test attacked New York City, but instead of being there, I was stuck in the Capitol building, watching Senator Joe McCarthy grill poor Carl Denham. The old movie producer had come down in the world after 1933. Senate investigators had found him in a Hollywood flop house where he had been for years. Anyone could tell he was just an old rummy, but McCarthy wanted this guy, claiming that by letting King Kong get loose in New York, Denham had shown the world how vulnerable American cities were to big monsters. The whole, so sh the whole show sickened me. Denham hardly seemed coherent under McCarthy's badger. Why did you impugn the pilots of the Army Air Corps by implying that they were the ones who, or they were not the ones who had killed the giant ape, the junior senator from Wisconsin demanded. I decided that I had had enough and walked out of the gallery. I found myself in a cloakroom next to a tall guy playing solitaire. His chest sported a raft of medals and his face looked familiar. Aren't you his son, I asked, jerking my thumb in the direction of McCarthy. Stepson, he said, his voice colder than the North Pole. I'm the senator's stepson, Raymond Shaw. For almost a year, I had run into guys who swore that Raymond Shaw was the kindest, wisest, warmest, most noble human being they'd ever met in their lives. Me? I thought he was an asshole. Maybe I decided you had to have been in Korea to get a line on the guy's charm. I went back to my office and found telegrams about the mysterious killings of California state troopers in the desert. I caught the next flight west and was on the spot when the giant ants erupted in Los Angeles. I had the top brass on the West Coast meet with some insect experts. Never thought I'd be an exterminator, the Air Force guy, Gener General Edwin Ferguson said. He impressed me as a real jerk, snorting through the electron ant behavior, endlessly shoveling bum into his mouth, and watching the rear end of the female entomologist more closely than her sides. General Ferguson, I said after the presentation, call me Buck, he said. Everyone does. Keep it zipped up, Buck, I said and you'll go places in this man's Air Force. Keep swinging it around and you'll be cleaning carburetors at Burkelsome Air Force Base until you retire. I was very impressed with how I handled the giant ants, killing them below ground, both in the desert and in the sewers, so the public didn't get too excited by the whole thing. A few weeks after I got back from Los Angeles, Ike called me into his office. Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, was there. Alan has been telling me about the Hapaquista movement in Latin America, Ike said. I think you can help him with this problem. When I raised my eyebrows, Dulles explained. The Hapaquista are a bunch of communist intellectuals who are trying to create a peasant revolution. 
They are based near the Black Lagoon in the Amazon Basin. He cleared his throat. Tradition says the lagoon is home to a monster of some kind. The next day, I arrived in Latin America with a plane load of agency types, all dressed like marine biologists. The Hapakista expected nothing and welcomed us as fellow eggheads. We went to the Black Lagoon and we found this prehistoric gill man. We lured him up out of the water using dismembered cattle that we had stolen from pro Hapakista villages. While Gilly stuffed himself, we banded him with an electronic device that shocked him into a frenzy. When the villagers arrived to look for their cattle, he killed several. The Hapakista tried to find Gilly, but we planted false sign and kept Gilly doped up and out of the way when they hunted. Then we turned him loose on those villages that supported the Hapakista. Finally, we depth charged the Black Lagoon and killed Gilly. We carried his body around the area from village to village. The peasants got the message. Gilly was more powerful than the Hapakista, and we were more powerful than Gilly. They finished off the Hapakista for us pronto. I got back to Washington. My reputation was golden. Shortly thereafter, I got a midnight phone call from Ike. Giant grasshoppers are eating Illinois missile, he said. You better get out there and stop them before they eat Stevenson and the Democrats run somebody with a pulse in 56. Arriving at the secret government lab in Chicago, I met an old friend. Ah, Herr Oberdruppenfuhrer, how good to see you. He was in a wheelchair, but I recognized him at once. It's, it's Merck, Merck. I'm an American now, he said. Strange love. You'll find it much easier to say. You're a citizen already? The Perlick. There was no paperwork linking me to any of Herr Professor Dr. Rothwang's more objectionable experiments. I indicated his wheelchair. Have an accident? Nine, Danka, I already had one. He laughed. See, I told you I'm an American. He raised a metal hand to remove his glasses while another wiped his tears with a handkerchief. My body is not as strong as those born in the conventional way. He replaced his glasses. But I assure you, Herr Obergruppenfuhrer, that my will is stronger. Strangelow's mind was pretty strong, too. He devised an artificial grasshopper mating call that lured the bugs into drowning themselves in Lake Michigan. Adlai Stevenson survived to run and lose in 1956, and Ike was happy. My personal involvement wasn't required in every crisis back then. Some crises resolved themselves very quickly. For example, one Los Alamos scientist had responded to the lifting of his security clearance by going into the desert and creating a giant tarantula. Fortunately, it was so far out in the desert that the Air Force could zap it before coming close to anything but a few hit towns. Ike and I watched the pilot who drilled the tarantula interviewed on Ed Murrow's person to person. I saw the tarantula advancing on this little town and I knew I had just one chance to save those people. The pilot paused and grinned at the camera. I asked myself, do you feel lucky? Punk, Ike said. He'd always thought flyboys were just headline grab. And when my missile hit that tarantula, it really made my day, the pilot said. Ike's personal feelings notwithstanding, the hot shot deserved the medal, and Mike and Ike sent me out west again to pin it on the guy. Incredible, that trip ended up saving the world. The ceremony was a long, hot war, as they always were, and when it was done, I just wanted to get back to Los Angeles as soon as possible. I drove all night, and by 3 a.m., I was passing a place called Santa Mira. Traffic was just crawling along, and after a while I could see why. There was this disheveled guy running around the highway like a maniac, trying to flag down cars. You are next, the guy yelled. They're here, you're next. I never pick up hitchhikers, but something about this guy told me that he was genuine. I got him in my car, heard his story, and called the FBI. We boxed off Santa Mira and found this lunatic was right. Everyone in town had been replaced by creatures from outer space. Strange love, lesson, figured out a way to identify and break down the metabolism of the aliens, even the ones who had escaped Santa Mira. It was our biggest victory yet over a challenge that had almost slipped past us, but Ike wouldn't let this victory go public. You can't put the idea before the American people that their next door neighbors might be space monsters. By once that idea gets loose, everyone would suspect that the other guy is from the, another planet and go after him with a gun or an ax. This country would tear itself apart neighborhood by neighborhood until all the real aliens had to do was walk in and pick up the pieces. He stopped and looked out the window. I almost think that we were intended to find out about Santa Mira so we would all go paranoid. He looked at me with real sadness in his eyes. No, Bissell, this is one story that has to be buried in a twilight zone of secrecy for the good of everyone. 
So nobody knew that we saved the earth yet again. I thought we didn't need the accolades. I had a wall of commendations already. Then Sputnik went up and Senator Kennedy began to accuse the administration of being so obsessed with giant bugs that we'd let the Soviets get ahead of us in missiles. The public, sad to say, was so unaware of our successes that they began believing him. I begged Ike to reveal the body snatcher invasion to the papers, but he refused. When Kennedy won the White House, I already had my bags packed. I resigned before they abolished my post. Strangelove was the only one there to see me off at the airport. He had sensed the shift in opinion and had repositioned himself as an expert on thermonuclear war. Kennedy was keeping him. Private life didn't agree with me. Before I went into the army, I'd enjoyed the outdoors, so I bought a place on the California coast. I hated it. I realized now that the sight of insects and reptiles terrified me. I was so nervous that even the sight of birds on a telephone wire or on a school's playground equipment could paralyze me with terror. I sold the place and moved to Manhattan, where I could look out my apartment window and imagine dinosaurs rising from the ocean. Most days, I would go over to the Empire State Building and try to see any trace of where Kong had landed. I couldn't find any. How the mighty have fallen, I said to the heedless pedestrians hurrying past. As for every American, President Kennedy's assassination came as a huge shock to me. However, the fact that Raymond Shaw had pulled the trigger did not surprise me. I had never liked him, and I guess that all that solitaire he had played had ruined his mind. Given the blow to the chain of command and the rumors that the Soviets were building a doomsday device, there was public clamor for a more credible deterrent, namely letting base commanders issue the go code in case the chain of command was broken. When I saw in the New York Times who was set to testify, I hopped on a train to Washington. What a gallery of familiar faces awaited me. Turgidson was there, flirting with a female political scientist who had just published an article in Foreign Affairs. He acted like he didn't remember me, but Ripper, my old North Pole poker pal, intercepted me at the water cooler. I saw that he was a general. Essence, wit, he said, pointing at the cup of water I was holding. It's all about essence. That's how they subvert you, essence. It's great to see you again, Jack, I said. Give the bastards hell. Just then Peter wheeled up and my eyes got misty. You are a born survivor, I told him. Working for your third administration? I bet that even if this doomsday device goes off, you'd survive. Ah, he said. Peace is our profession, but war... His eyes got an odd distant look. War is just a hop. Barked with laughter and I had to chuckle too. A page came into the room and signaled that the witnesses had to testify now. I waved at them as they left, patriots all. I was proud to have served with them in the greatest conflict of the 20th century, the struggle to keep America safe from modern science gone mad. Hey guys, I said, we'll meet again, okay? The end. Thank you, Michael. Wow, that was quite a different story than the last one you read. I love the diversity in your writing. What was the favorite part about writing this particular story for you? Well, this story came about because I noticed there's this one actor, Whit Bissell, who like is almost in every 1950s sci-fi movie. You know, he's in Creature from the Black Lagoon, okay. and he's in The Manchurian Candidate, and um, is an invasion of the body snatchers and stuff like that. And I thought, okay, well, let's try to take a guy and we'll name him Whit Bissell and put him sort of like every science fiction movie sort of running from, you know, Metropolis 1927 to Doctor Strange Club 1964. And so it was like trying to fit in all the different references to movies and stuff like that and things. So, you know, it was the structure of this, you know, working on the structure of this. Sure. Yeah. It, it felt a little bit like, uh, a puzzle homage to mm -hmm. Hollywood science fiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good way to talk about it. Yeah. That was very cool. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us on the program. I hope you'll come again and read for us again. Oh, I look forward to it. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Have a great day. Okay, you too.